there should be one or two spare copies in fact. Okay, now, um, this is the geography of the soul, according to uh, Aristotle and St. Thomas, it's the classic philosophy, um, the crayons ago. Uh, you've got, as you, see, as you see there, you've got, um, at, the, at the bottom you've got, there are three layers from top to bottom and then two great compartments from side to side. You've got the vegetative power, at the bottom layer, you've got the vegetative powers. That's the powers that we share with the vegetables, well, with plants. That's not too interesting. It, uh, Aristotle gives it, says there are three powers, um, three powers of the, of the human soul, because the human soul has all the powers of vegetables, it has all the powers of brute animals, and it has the powers of the angels. The human being is the most complicated of all God's creatures because he's the only one that's spiritual and material. He shares materiality with the uh, brute animals and the plants. He shares spirituality with the angels and with Almighty God. Almighty God is, is, not, is way, way above these category of his creatures, but nevertheless he is purely spiritual. The angels are purely spiritual, only they're limited while well, God is unlimited. But the, you could say God is, of course, spiritual. The angels are spiritual. Man is spiritual. Man is material. Animal is material. Vegetable is material. And mineral is material. Mineral has got no life, so it, it doesn't figure here. But you've got the vegetative powers, which are um, in order of dignity. The, the lowest is digestion of food. Then you've got the power of growth from child, from young to old, and then you've got the power of reproduction. Uh, the seagull, for instance, is a marvelous fly. It's, it's a delight to watch it, but and mankind firstly can't produce anything that flies like that. It, me, men are absolutely incapable of producing any sort of thing. Their machines, the smartest fly of their flying machines, are clumsy, clumsy compared with the seagull. What is more, the seagull can reproduce, it's got life, it's got reproduce, it can reproduce. The machine, of course, can't reproduce. So uh, man is just not in the same league as Almighty God when it comes to creating. Um, but there, there you've got the three, reprodu the three reproductive powers. Beyond that, you've got a little schema, which is another story, don't, don't worry about it. That's not vegetative, it's, that's in green and red, it's, it's not, doesn't concern us yet. So the, the vegetative powers don't really concern us, but when it comes to the, these four main powers, divide as follows. Um, so here you've got the senses, the sense level is the middle layer, and then above the sense, You've got the obviously the um, moderation. Oh, no. You've got the level of reason or in, the intellective level. Um, intellective. So this is the intelligence, these are the senses. So you've got the, the higher layer, the lower layer, and vegetable, the, the lowest layer. That's not really very complicated. The complication becomes, what's the, what is the nature of this division across from left to right? And that is that these are knowing powers, powers of knowing, and these are powers of desiring. And the knowing comes first because I cannot desire anything without first knowing it. That's common sense. Again, that is common sense. Um, Nikil volitum, nisi precognitum, nothing wanted unless it's firstly known. So you've got Intellective knowing, intellective desiring, 
sense knowing and sense desiring. And intellect is above sense because sense is tied in with matter, whereas intellect in itself, uh, in human beings, it's also work, it, it's the, the, the human intellect is in a material body, but that's not essential to intellection as such. Intellection as such is um, independent of sensation, independent of matter. So sense is tied into matter, is locked into matter, is clogged with matter. Intellect is, is flying free as a bird by itself. So the intellective powers go from left to right at top. The sense powers go from, from left to right uh, underneath. The, um, and right, left to right is knowing to desiring. So you've got sense knowing, sense desiring, intellective knowing, uh, intellective knowing, intellective desiring. That's the great uh, structure of this schema. And then you've got a lot of details filled in. So, um, you've, human desiring begins with human knowing, and human knowing, uh, human knowing uh, begins with the senses. So all human knowing begins with the, the five senses. Modern philosophy, modern, sen modern, modern philosophies are stupid, absolutely stupid. There's no other word for them. And they, they scorn the senses and they doubt sensation. They live by sensation all day long. They, they can't walk out of the door without recognizing that it's a door. They don't try, you don't see people trying to walk out through the wall because automatically, 24 hours a day, everybody is in reality trusting their senses. And here comes the modern philosopher that says, I can't see anything, I can't hear anything, but I'm cooking up a marvelous kitchen inside my head. Inside his head, he's a lunatic because he's refusing to recognize and admit what he lives by all day long. Modern philosophers uh, live by denying what they live by. They make a living off denying what they live by. Uh, it's just ridiculous. It's, and it's tragic because these, these youngsters come into these modern universities and they, they, some of them gravitate towards the philosophy department because they say to themselves, this should be interesting and this should be vital, this should be very important. They're quite right. It should be interesting, it should be important. It is important. Philosophy is the queen of the sciences, not just of the sentimentalities, which is what the stupid modern philosophers think. But um, sensation is it, so. You've got this huge diagonal on the on the schema. You've got this huge diagonal split between the which is between the outer senses, the five classic outer senses: sight, hearing, sh uh, smell, touch, and taste. Of these, the highest dignity is sight, because it is the most far-reaching in in matter. I can see a long, long way away. I can only hear a long way away, or a certain way away. The smell, the touch, and the taste are all confined to, <coughs> confined to my body. The scholastics, which is the church philosophers, are always concerned when they make, when they are studying a whole, W-H-O-L-E, something in its totality, they then split it up into its parts, and then they study the parts, and then there's the, one of the questions about parts, which is the highest of these parts? So they're always studying the parts, and then the dignity of the parts. And the in dignity, sight comes first, hearing is at a distance, but the other three are tied to my body. I can't taste outside my body, I can't touch outside my body, and I can't smell outside my body. So, sight and hearing come numbers one and two. And they feed into the inner senses, the four inner senses, which you've got there in red. And these four inner senses feed upwards into the mind. And it's another classic principle of the scholastics, and no doubt of Aristotle also, for whom the scholastics, on whom the scholastics amply drew. 
And God raised St. Thomas Aquinas at the moment when the Arabs were risked uh, creating an interpretation of Aristotle which would f fly in the face of the church fathers and the religious teaching. And therefore there would be a split between uh, real life, so to speak, and religious life, which is deadly for religion, then religion is just unreal. If you split religion from reality, religion is unreal, obviously. So, um, in fact, the scholastics say, there is nothing in the mind that is not first in the senses. And that's not materialism, it's simply the reality. I, I, know, I know nothing with my mind which did not first, in one shape or another, come through my senses. In one form or another, come through my senses. So the senses, these four internal senses, feed the mind upwards. And as knowing precedes desiring, the, the, the senses feed also the, um, the sensitive appetite, the sensitive which divides into two faculties or powers, the irascible and the concupiscible. And uh, Aristotle, uh, uh, St. Thomas certainly says, I'm sure he's following Aristotle, there are five passions in the irascible and six passions in the concupiscible. And the most basic passion comes from the Latin patio pati passusum. And it doesn't necessarily mean my flying into a rage, there are, there, there are, there's a variety of 11 different passions and um, they are named from the fact that every passion is some kind of, uh, it's something passive. Um, every act of, an, of, a, of, a, of the, uh, every act of the uh, sense desiring faculties is uh, a passive act. In other words, sensation, I am passive, and uh, the, the object uh, imposes itself on me. My, I am in relation to the, my senses are, and the animal senses are, any of the animal senses are, a man is only a rational animal, he's not an angel, he's only a rational animal. Um, man, man's passions, like the animal passions, are uh, submissive to the object outside. The object outside makes the uh, sensation. Um, th th then, a brief look at these four inner senses. You've got firstly the common sense, which is not the same as common sense in the normal way in which we use it in everyday life. Common sense in, this, in the good old muddy English language, common sense means being, being sensible means being reasonable. Reasonable is the top layer, sensible is in theory the lower layer. But English has confused things and so sensible, our normal meaning of common sense is actually something of the mind. Common sense is something of the mind. So, it's, it, so this is not the common sense which is, this is the common sense in, in a different meaning. And the meaning is that it's like the telephone exchange inside the human soul which receives, which receives the data from the five different senses and stitches them together. Because the eye can't hear, the ear can't see, and therefore, but you know that what you're listening to at present is something black in front of you that you can see, some sense inside us is stitching together what you're listening to and what you're seeing. And that's the common sense, called common sense, because it is, a, it is the inner faculty stitching together the data of all five outer senses. So the first sense, that the first inner sense that receives the data from the outer senses is the common sense. So you've got their five little arrows to show the, set, the outer senses feeding the common sense. Then, uh, the, again, a very rational way of at, d distinguishing the four faculties. And the next faculty is the instincts. Human beings have instincts as well. 
and the instinct, uh, whereas the common sense is the receiver of present sense data. Okay, so whenever, whenever my outer senses, five outer senses, are functioning, functioning also inside is the common sense, which is stitching the da data together into a data package, as we might call it. Package because it's, it's put together from five different sources, potentially five different sources often only seeing, often only hearing, often seeing and hearing, which is what it is at the moment. I'm touching, the clothes I'm wearing are touching me, I can sense those, smell and taste, uh, depending on whether there is smell and taste around. But the common sense is the receiver of present sense data. That feeds into instinct, and it also feeds into memory, and it also feeds into uh, imagination. So the common sense feeds the three other inner senses. The instinct is the interpreter of present sense data. For instance, a sheep hears a howl on a nearby hill uh, under the moon and the sheep begins to run in the opposite direction because its instinct tells it that this particular shape, this particular sound, is an enemy, a dangerous enemy, so the, sheep, it's, it's, the sheep's instincts tell it to scarper, to, to get away. Uh, human beings have instincts as well. Somebody threatens to hit me over the head, my in instinctively my arm goes up. That's, sen the, that's sensation. The, the, the mind doesn't play too much of a part in that. It's just sheer instinct to protect my head from being bashed in. Then imagination and memory. Um, the imagination is the storer of past sense data. And the memory is the storer of past sense interpretation. So you notice that as, as the common sense is, and the, the imagination receive and store from the past. The, the common sense receives in the present, the imagination stores from the past what has one time been in the common sense, and the memory is uh, distinguished from the imagination here as the interpreter of past sense images. So imagination and memory are functions that apply to the past, common sense and instinct apply to the present. So you've got an entire box, the past, the present receiver, the present interpreter, the past receiver, the receiver of the past, and the interpreter of the past. Imagination and memory. The, the two terms, imagination and memory, are used rather more loosely in everyday life, but those are the original, that is the original rational way of analyzing what must be going on inside a human being. Every human being realizes he's got um, instincts and he has memory. And he also, he can call up in his imagination memories as images of the past. Imagination is obviously aimed, named from images. Instinct is what is instinctus, what is what put into us, what we're sort of endowed with, what, we, what is given to us. If we believe in God, it's easy to understand God having put together all of these nine, nine powers, five external senses, four internal senses. Um, it's God who created the human being, who's quite a complicated creature. The creator is God. But for, if, for, if you believe in God, then it's, it's easy to imagine how this such a complicated creature arose. He was directly created with all of these interacting powers. And it's not obviously by evolution. That's, that's ridiculous. So um, those, that is sense apprehension. That what the senses, including in man, like in all the brute animals, there are these five outer senses which feed the four inner senses. And in the case of man, these four inner senses also feed, feed in their turn the intellect or the mind. 
very interestingly in the, the, the question of mankind is a complicated creature. His knowing is complicated. Um, knowing, we haven't got the, the word we really need in, in English, but um, in, in Latin you've got cognitio, that's knowing. And that splits into intellectio and sensatio, intellection and sensation. In English, if you use knowing for cognitio, what have we got to distinguish in English from intellectio, intellectio from sensatio? Sensation, we've taken over the word. The word intellection doesn't usually exist in English. Nor does the activity of intellection exist in English. Because the English are not very intelligent. They think they are, but they're not really very intelligent. Uh, we do believe in sensation. We love our dogs. Uh, but, um, and we love our, our beer. But uh, intellection is not the favourite activity of Englishmen. Um, but the, the, also in Latin you've got the activity, the act of intellection, which is, which is intelligere. The word uh, means, um, the, the, it's the faculty that reads inside. Now, there's a, I have a classic picture, well, some, some of you will already know, this black pen is not very powerful for the picture, but um, what is this? Uh, hold on. If you know what it is, don't yell, just um, keep quiet, if you know. There's a square, and then there is, divides in four, but then there are two lines coming down like that, and then the lines contain a number of circles. How many of you have seen this one already? Quite a few of you. Okay, hold, hold your peace for a few moments. I hope you were persuaded by what is meant to uh, tell. I think you certainly should be persuaded. And then there's another line there. Now, those of you that don't already know, what is it? What is it? It looks like um, one, two, three, four square lines two inside and another two inside. It's eight straight lines with a number of circles. That's what the eyes see. The sensation is of eight, li eight lines in black on with, with little circles in between two of the lines. What is it? You're gonna, those of you who haven't seen this before, you're gonna laugh gently when you find out. And you're gonna say, ah, oh, of course, ho, 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 ho. It's a giraffe walking past a window. <laughs> before you were told, when, and the first, this must have been true the first time you saw it, before you were told, the sensation was complete. Eight lines with little, little circles. What is it? Don't know. But that's the mind trying to work. What happened was that at last, when you were told, the mind was able to read behind the sensations, or read in the sensation. So intellection and sensation are not the same thing. You were sensing before you were intelligent, and your, your senses told you, that gave you the raw materials, but it's your mind that understood the meaning of the raw materials. Similarly, when I do a little pen man, it bears almost no resemblance it is just again one, two, three, four uh, straight lines and one circle. But you, you the mind immediately recognizes it's meant to be a human being, and he's got some feet as well, maybe. Um, you, you should be persuaded, and a lot of philosophers will try to deny that there's any difference. And you get these regular stupid television programs put on by the Masons and we know who, the awkward people, WKW, we know who, the awkward people behind the Masons 
behind Islam, behind uh, communism, these same people are at work to destroy what remains of our civilization. And what they are doing is constantly using television to put forward programs, for instance, and I guess this is another thing I often say, Mr. and Mrs. Dolphin. There's a big fish tank and there are two dolphins in it. And on T, the TV program presents with a man in a white coat, of course, and big thick grim spectacles, Mr. Scientist, can you tell us what Mr. and Mrs. Dolphin are saying to one another? Oh, he puts, his, he puts on a very complicated ear mechanism. He plugs it into the side of the tank and he puts on his most solemn po-faced face and he says, That's Mr. Dolphin saying to Mrs. Dolphin, I love you. Oh, is it, Mr. Scientist? Oh, oh, yes. And then, ee! what's that sound of Mrs. Dolphin? Oh, puts on the earphones, checks, plugs in. And then he's in the most serious manner. She is saying to him, get lost. <laughs> These stupid programs to pretend that there's no essential difference between human beings and animals. Human beings have a whole complete layer much superior to the mere senses. But that the, the, the modern scientists, quote unquote, try to deny that there is that difference, try to pretend that we just react like brute animals, which to some extent we do, but not essentially. And they pretend that uh, the brute animals have got intelligence. You keep hearing about some animal or other which is behaving as though it's intelligent. It's intelligent because God gave it instincts and he's intelligent. God is intelligent. And he puts instincts, a variety of instincts into all of these brute animals, different instincts for different animals. He puts animal instincts into ourselves as well. And we have animal appetites in human beings. But we also have mind and will above. And you've just had an example. As your mind interpreted what an animal can't interpret, an animal's got instincts to read what the what sensations are coming to him but he's got no more than animal instincts he's not got the reason intellect and will my man has and you've just seen you've seen your own reason at work to in, interpret yes that's a giraffe walking past the window the animal can't tell that he's got no possible way of knowing it so those are the four inner senses and they feed the mind and there's nothing in the mind that wasn't first in the senses. That is again is a big claim. But, well, let's let's put it this way: the the mind has got invisible ink. the The mind is, so to speak, it's a, it's a comparison. The mind is inscribed by God with invisible ink. The moment the mind has some sensation coming through the senses to it. The mind, the invisible ink, immediately becomes to become, begins to become invisible, and I understand certain intelligible principles, like the principle, especially the principle of non-contradiction. That is to say, a thing cannot be and not be in the same respect and at the same time. That's an intelligent principle which no animal ever got, got hold of. But the human mind, that becomes to life the, that principle comes to life the moment that mind begins to be activated by the, the material coming from the sensation, the sense material coming from the sen inner and outer senses. There you have there uh, the distinction between the agent intellect and the passive intellect. Man is a complicated animal and his desiring is complicated, a complicated mixture of sense and intellect. Or, or sense and reason, let's say, and his knowing is complicated, a combination of sensation and intellection. The angels know in a quite different way because they've got no bodies. The animals know in a quite different way because they've got no reason. 
But in man, intellection, just passing by and briefly, the, um, the agent intellect is picking, is abstracting, is taking the, uh, the you've, it's just been a work in yourselves, it's taking the intelligible content out of the sense package. The senses can't get inside the sense package. The senses cannot get inside the sense package. Compare a slave com commissioned to carry a jewel to the queen in a box. The slave has the box, he's holding the box, he carries the box with the jewel to the queen. If he did not carry the box, she would not get the jewel, but he cannot get inside the box. It's only the queen that has the key to get inside the box so that she can get the jewel. So the agent intellect picks the jewel out of the box and it moves over like a crane, having picked something out of the back, out of, let's say, of the back of a, having picked something off a heap, a heap of, um, let's say, gravel. And then the crane moves over and drops the gravel into the back of a truck. And the, back, the truck is like the passive intellect. These are very important questions, in fact, to refute the stupid modern philosophers. Because the scholastics have the correct interpretation of human knowing, the, the modern philosophers foul up the process of knowing. It is complicated. It's easy to foul up because it's so complicated. And by fouling it up, they liberate man from reality. And so men are free to go crazy in the modern world because of rotten philosophers fouling up the process of human knowing, which is why, it, you, which is why you need, if you get into that kind of thing, to, to understand the difference between the passive intellect and the agent intellect. The agent intellect, the, so the intellect is active in picking the intellect, intelligible meaning out of the sense package. That is active. But if the mind was active in knowing the object, it wouldn't know the object. To know the object has got to be passive. To pick out the content has got to be active. And that's why Aristotle will have said there must be two faculties. They've got different acts. One is active and the other is passive. If the passive intellect was not passive, we would not know things as they are. We would be acting upon the, the sense data instead of receiving from the sense data. If I don't receive in my knowing, I'm not knowing what I'm what I'm knowing. I am imposing upon what I think, what I, what what I, the sense data that I'm getting. I'm imposing the meaning. That's modern philosophy. That's in particular Kant. Kant, uh, 1832 to, uh, 1732 to 1804 is the great villain. Uh, no, 18th, 1734 to 1804 is the great villain of, back again, I think it's 1824, 18, 1724 to 1804. He lived for 80 years. And he's a real villain. And he must have known what he was doing. He was, he was undermining common sense. And because Kant is now supreme in all the universities, in the felt philosophy department of all the universities, and he is nonsense. Stupid nonsense. He's pretending that he is making the door the door. That the door would not be out the door if he did not, in his side, his own head, make it a door. Which is just insane. So if he doesn't want to make it a door, he's going to make it a wall. And he was told uh, that uh, Wellington had invaded Portugal. He said no. He was told, Wellington has invaded Portugal. No, no. No, no. Because in his mind, that was impossible. That's the worst of German philosophy. That's why German philosophy has such a bad reputation. Because it's they who, who really separated modern man from reality. Not, I mean, every, most every man now thinks like Kant. Every, many men in the street think like Kant. They have common sense when it comes to living, 
But when they begin to philosophize, they think like Kant. In order to be free from the object, to be free from God's reality. They don't want God's reality, they want their own fantasy. So when it comes to walking through the door, they will know that it's a door. Thank you very much, says the door. I'm, it's nice to be recognized. But when it comes to Almighty God, and God being the creator, and God being the master, and God being supreme, no. No, no. I refuse that. I believe in evolution, and so on, and so on, and so on. So the Asian intellect picks up, abstracts the, uh, the essence, the intelligible essence, which the senses can't pick up. The intelligible essence out of the sense data, whereas the passive intellect, um, what does that say, that in brackets? Um, I can't read it. Lorry. Uh, the, yes, that's a lorry. And the crane and the lorry, that's right. The crane and the lorry. The passive intellect does the actual intelligible. The active intellect intelligibilizes makes intelligible what is not by itself intelligible because it's locked up inside matter. The, the, the Asian intellect extracts the intelligible content from the matter. The, it's the passive intellect that passively receives that intelligible content and recognizes it, for instance, as a giraffe and so on. A giraffe walking past the window. Then you move right and, you, and you've got in um, the will, the relationship between the will and the mind. The intellect, the, actually the two arrows, are, are, the, the, the higher arrow should be the mind. But the, the, the higher arrow is there, the, the will applies the mind. I do not want to know. Don't tell me I don't want to know. That's the will unapplying the mind. Somebody wants to tell me something and I say to him, I don't want to know. And the, the psalmist says, I don't want to know. So the, the, the will applies or unapplies the mind to what the will wants to know, free will, whereas the mind informs and motivates the will. The mind gives what it's learned from the senses to the will and the will then makes a free decision whether it wants to apply the mind to that or not. I want to commit adultery. I don't want to hear about the Sixth Commandment. So I'm not going to hear about the Sixth Commandment, etc., etc. So the will is, um, you could say the mind is like the king and the will is like the queen. And she commands what the king does, as, as you well know, I'm sure. Um, and the, the mind motivates the will by giving the will its object, by presenting the will with its object. What the mind has picked up of reality, it presents to the will, and the will then chooses and works on it and um, applies the mind and so on. So that's the relationship between the mind and the will. You come to the will, and you've got already in little brackets, compare melody. The will corresponds to melody. Melody corresponds to the will. The me melody is the, is the essence of music. It's the higher part of the music. It's the interpretation of the, uh, the line of, of a, the tune is a line. And the line speaks to the mind. Color speaks to the senses. Line speaks to the mind in painting, if you think about it. The, the, the line gives the essential message. If the colour is just splashed all over the place, like in modern art, you've got mindless big paintings. Whereas, of course, classic paintings all have a d definite meaning. They, they correspond to something in reality. And they tell of something in reality by the line. It's not by the colour. The colour enables you to see the line, but the line is what tells, if you think about it. So the will corresponds to melody, and the melodic line in a piece of music goes to the goes to the will and the mind. It goes to the reason. Reason can be used either for for mind or for the whole. Since man is an, a creature of reason, then uh, 
and since he has the two higher faculties, mind and will, reason can be used to cover both mind and will. It's that whole upper part of the soul which makes the human animal different from all the brute animals. We are endowed with something quite different and far superior to any, what any brute animal is, is endowed with, you know, by God. We come down then from the will to the two, the, the, the two more great faculties, the concupiscible and the irascible. These are the two powers, we can't go into all the logic here, again it's a logical analysis given, given what one observes of human beings under their behaviour. You can make a chart of the eleven passions and the concupiscible passions are, are inside a frame of the, uh, of the ir I'm sorry, the in irascible passions, the five irascible passions are inside a frame of the six concupiscible passions. Again, passion is not just rage, um, although the irascible, which is the faculty for five of these passions, is named from anger because the angry passion is the most notable of the five passions in the irascible. The concupiscible frames the irascible, the concupiscible is desire. And of the two you can say broadly, uh, the irascible corresponds to rhythm in music and the concupiscible corresponds to harmony. If you want to get people all feeling and loving, you get you build up some slushy harmony, gooey harmony, and I, I, I just sort of start going gooey. That's a caricature of how harmony works. Harmony is something much more noble and much more beautiful and much more important than that. But it gives you an idea of how harmony might be associated with concupiscible, whereas rhythm, dum, 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 dum. Uh, you know, military music is usually rhythmic. To get people to go to war, you get a kettle drum. To get people to go to war, you to stir up their fighting instincts, their fighting passions. So there's the, the irascible and the concupiscible. They are the, sen the two faculties of the sense appetite. So broadly, the, the correspondence with music would be that melody is in the will, Harmony is in the concupiscible and rhythm is in the irascible. Then rhythm and harmony are the low, in the lower part of the soul, so to speak. You, it's, it's a broad, a broad correspondence. There you can start objecting in, in all kinds of ways um, to uh, on, on detail, but it, it certainly let's just say this if you if you analyze the geography of music as as its three major components being melody uh, harmony and rhythm they correspond broadly to these three desiring faculties in in the human being which are the will the irascible and the concupiscible then uh, on this schema in addition in fact you've got um You've got the four, the four cardinal virtues correspond to these four faculties: prudence in the mind, um, justice in the will. You've got it on the chart in, in, in little boxes: fortitude in the irascible and temperance, self-control, temperance in the concupiscible appetite. So the the will, the the, the scholastics connect directly the four main virtues, the four cardinal virtues, from cardo cardinus in Latin meaning a hinge, the four hinge virtues on which all the other virtues hinge, prudence, uh, justice, fortitude and temperance. Then you've got the four wounds of original sin in red next door. Uh, the, the, the wound of ignorance in the, the wounds of original sin because original sin was in the soul of course it was in the higher low human soul and in the lower human soul both Adam and Eve were material and spiritual, spiritual and material creatures 
both of them sinned higher and lower. So um, ignorance is the, is the wound of the human mind and it has to learn and learn and learn to overcome ignorance and even then there's far more that it's going to be ignorant of than there is going to be that it knows. Malice is the wound of the will. The will, people, people are naturally nasty. Little, little children are naturally nasty. They grab one another's toys, they pull one another's hair, whatever it may be. You can observe original sin at work in little children. By moments they're little angels and by other moments they're little monkeys. You, you know that. They're certainly not uh, completely innocent. There is an innocence to them if they're not acting out of the original sin. But then you turn your back and the sin comes. You can watch the malice at work. It's there. And an education which doesn't take account of the malice in boys and doesn't spank them is a very defective education. And the education which pretends that they're all really very nice and all they need is a half hour talking to is absolute nonsense. They need their backside to be well warmed and that hurts for half a minute. Then they forget it and it's all, uh, they've taken their punishment. Justice has been restored. Daddy, dad has restored justice. They've been punished. Forget about it. Off we go again. Until the next spanking. <laughs> but scripture says, it's, it's scripture which says, in at least three places, I think it is, in the book of Proverbs, spare the rod and spoil the child. Because, in, because original sin is in him and it's got to be knocked out of him as best you can. Then the, in, the, the weakness of the irascible is, uh, is weak. The, the, the original sin in irascible is weakness and the original sin in the concupiscible is concupiscence or desire. Um, uncontrolled desire. Malicious desire. So you've got there the four wounds. You've also got the three, in green, you've got the three, I think it's in green, or is it in black? Can't see. You've got the three theological virtues. Faith is in the mind. That's an important point. The Protestants, faith is chocolate in my breast. Feelings, feelings. Protestantism is feelings because it it's despises reason. Luther despised reason. And therefore, there's only feelings left. In modernism, in the modern church, in the novice order church, you've got effeminate priests because they've because their their new religion eliminates reason or scorns reason, like Protestantism. If you scorn the whole top layer, all that remains is the lower layer. There's a it has been defined by the church that women have reason. Uh, one might not believe it if the church had not defined it. But um, if you accuse the novice order of, of being effeminate, it's because they are not so strong in reason. That's what's... They're not so strong in reason as men. They are stronger in emotion. They may well be stronger in will, but they're not so strong in reason. It's not usually much use arguing with a woman. I'm sure many of you know that. Um, because you, you try facing them straight on and before you know where they are, they're in a 180 degree different position. They're right round the back of you and, you, and then you, 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 you wheel your guns around <laughs> and you try to shoot at them, but woof, off they, are, off they go again. They're arguing by instinct, which is in the lower level of the soul, so to speak. They're... St. Thomas says, ut in pluribus, in most cases, women are not strong in reason, in most cases. He's, he allows for exceptions, which is, again, common sense, which is observable. There are exceptional women who, you, apparently, the great Russian writer Solzhenitsyn said that Mrs. Thatcher thought like a man, which is, I guess, from a, for, uh, a great compliment. I don't know if it was true or not, but w women are emotional, they're strong in emotion because they're designed by God for a different purpose than men. And man should be the head and the woman is meant to be the heart. And a human being, the head is on top, so 
But the church fathers say, because this is, the church fathers say, woman was taken from, Eve was taken from man's rib because she wasn't to be taken from his head, because she wasn't to be the equal of a man, or pretend that she's the equal of a man, at least in human dealings. Before God, that's a different thing. Of course, all human souls are equal before God. But be before God is not how things are here below on this earth. Here below on this earth, um, man is to be the head as woman is to be the heart. And if women are creatures of love, they're stronger in love, they're stronger in emotion, they're stronger in will, but they're not stronger in reason. And that's, the, that's just the way... The way things are. That's how Almighty God designed the human couple. And it's, there's a marvellous complementarity between man as he should be, manly, and woman as she should be, womanly. There's a marvellous complementarity, and they're made to fit together in marriage in order to have children, in order to populate heaven. You've got faith is in the mind, it's not feelings in the heart, it's, it's, it's knowledge. A supernatural knowledge which I can't get for myself with my natural powers. The, th the theorem of Pythagoras I can grasp with my natural powers. But um, the faith is um, in the mind. Hope and charity are in the will. Charity is a form of love uh, uh, that corresponds to the will. Okay, then... Uh, Notice the, uh, the relations here between the will and the passions. In theory, the will commands the passions. In, but, in, but Aristotle observed that the will does not always command the passions. The passions get out of control of the will, and so the, the passions don't always obey the will. You get obeys with a question mark, a double question mark. The, it's, it's a... What did, I think Aristotle calls it um, a political dominance, meaning it's not a tyrannical dominance. The will does, is not automatically obeyed by the passions. The passions have a will of their own, so to speak. Then you have got a little uh, diagram in red between the will and the passions. And that is the desire of man's heart, the desire of the human heart. The desire of the human heart is a mixture. Love with a big red heart there. Um, in intellect, what's that? Plans? Something that's... I think that's ILS, our intellect and senses. It's a mixture. Human love is a mixture of the material and the spiritual. I plus S. I plus S. Intellect plus sense, that's right intellect and sense. So human love is partly sensual. Woe to it if it isn't also intellectual. It's certainly partly intellectual also. Woe to it if the intellect pretends that it's not sensual. Woe to the... Woe, woe. Man is neither angel... is both angel and beast, spiritual and material. Woe to him if he thinks an angel without being a beast. Woe to him if he thinks a beast without being an angel. He's both. Um... So human love is a mixture of the higher and the lower. Um, then you have, what else? There's just a little diagram below. If you take it that, the, the little diagram at the very bottom, bottom right, in green and red, green for go, red for, red for stop. Same music, the melody goes to the head, the harmony goes to the heart and the rhythm goes to the feet. And melody is queen, uh, harmony is in between the two, and rhythm is lowest. If then, in modern music, like rap and rock and, and the rest of it, if, you, if rhythm comes first, harmony comes second, and melody is dethroned, you've got a secondary kind of music, an, in, an objectively inferior music. Music is not just uh, a question of taste, not just, not only. It's, uh, the Beethoven is objectively superior to the Beatles, 
uh, superior in, in melody, superior in the greater variety of harmony and judging of harmony, and placing of harmony, and superior in rhythm. There's a much greater variety of rhythm. Beethoven is, uses all three. Um, Uh, John, play, if you, if you will, the, the first part of the Coriolanus Overture. Now, let me, some of you have seen the Coriolanus schema before, you will see, uh, look at it tomorrow. But just to show how um, Beethoven is definitely descending to the level of the passions. He's not only passionate, but he is passionate. There's not much that's obviously the passion. Is that a fair statement, John? Yes, yes, I would say so. Re rhetoric, but not passion so much. Yes. Okay, now, uh, Coriolanus was a Roman general who um, beat up all the, conquered all of the late neighboring tribes. But then he wasn't recognized, he, rec he considered that his gifts and his talents to his home city weren't sufficiently recognized. So he went off and joined the army of one of Rome's enemies. He then came back, he, he, leading this army, he was a very good general, leading this army to beat up Rome. The Romans, what are they going to do? The Romans uh, sent out his, his, um, his family, his wife, his children, no effect. They sent out his mother and... Uh, Coriolanus crumbled and uh, left Rome alone, failed to crush Rome, went back with the Volsci, who undoubtedly killed him because he betrayed them and so on and so on. But he, so he is, um, in the music it's pretty clear uh, that the general is very angry, whereas the women are pleading. And you can hear that very clearly in the music. Uh, John, play the exposition.
to the general. Guess who's won? <laughs> <laughs> the, the the general is clearly defeated. So, uh, but there you can see very clearly the the um, the jagged uh, rhythmic the, the rhythm is strong. 
and then the gentleness and lyricism and the sweetness of the of the pleading women. Um, it's very, very clear. So there, the Arasal and the Concubus were very clearly, and the 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 will, the melody and the will. So you have the women commanding, as we might expect. Any any questions there, so far? That's the broad lines of the correspondence between, I think, that between uh, the geography of the mind, of the, of the soul, and the geography of music. It does, there is a correspondence, as you would expect, because music is a very human activity. The animals, uh, what is significant is that animals respond to music. There are, there's a clip of elephants there's a man playing a piano out in the bush and some elephants come up and start listening. There's another one of a woman playing a violin. These clips on, the, on, on YouTube because it's, it's, it's a matter of interest uh, that, that animals do respond to music. What's going on? Um, Was well, it a particular type of music they responded to? Uh, I think they like the melodic. I think they like Mozart, the melodic. I think. Mozart, Mozart, yes. I know, I know the birds like Mozart. Yes. When I was playing Mozart earlier, they were going... <laughs> yes, that's right. That figures. That figures, yes. Um, because music expresses an order. And these are creatures of God, and the order... Good music is the order is of God. And so the, it's natural that the animals respond to an order in their ears, in their senses, in, in their sense soul. It's the same God. And what's interesting is that even plants respond to music. That seems strange. But it's, been a, it's an experiment that I think Protestants made once in the United States. It's probably been experimented more than once. Four sandboxes, exactly the same earth, exactly the same temperature, exactly the same humidity, um, but four different musics piped into the four different boxes. One rock music, two um, classical music, three Gregorian chant, and four silence. Silence, the plant reacts normally. Gregorian chant, the plant thrives. Classical music, it semi-thrives. Rock, it collapses. Uh, if there are experiments you made, you may believe it, you may not believe it. But it makes sense, because plants also are creatures of God. And they are in between, vegetable is in between animal and mineral. Mineral obviously doesn't respond to music at all, because it's got no, no life in it. What is surprising is that the plants apparently have no sensation, and yet there they are, still responding there's, there's, there are mysteries locked into the creation of God, into the various parts of the creation of God. And uh, music is a special language given by God to human beings. I don't think any animal pr plays music, or I don't think anybody pretends that any animal plays music. Of course, the birds sing, some birds sing beautifully. But again, that's given them by God. But it's astonishing what sound of music pours out of these little little things. It's all obviously God's handiwork. But uh, the, the music is special to human beings. Like a sense of humor is special to human beings. Um, it's, it's a, it, music is a gift of the same kind. Except music is a gift of God to express things in the soul things going on in the soul, which no other language can express in the same way. Opera is, um, is not the words, it's the music that carries the emotion. But the interesting thing is that the words are very important to the composers. The words inspire the composer, and the composed composer then writes music. The, wor the words cannot express what the music expresses, but it's the, the words that, that lead, that give the line to the composer's mind with which he then, then puts together the music. 
um, Jim Morrison of the Doors was more proud of his words than he was of his music. Um, Wagner wrote both the words and the music of his, of his operas. Um, most operas, the, the, word, the, the wordsmith is different from the musician. Um, but the words are crucial to the composer's inspiration. But he's not expressing, he's not really expressing it in words. The composer is expressing what, what the words express, what the words describe of what's going, inside the, going on inside the human soul, the composer puts into music. And the music, the words of the opera without the music would make a very poor play. In most cases would make a, an, uninteresting, an uninteresting play. But whoever the composer is, he's usually inspired by the words. And the words, therefore, are very important. Therefore, parents should not only listen to the music that their children are listening to today, they should also listen, check on the words, because the words will tell what, what, what inspired the, the musician. And very often, of course, especially in the case of great music, there's a, serious, there's a real correspondence between the words and the music. The parents have got to be careful with, with rock music. They, they, the temptation is to say, for parents today, the temptation is to say, oh, music, that's only music. Be careful. The Pied Piper of Hamelin stole children with music. He played on his flute and all the children followed him as a punishment for the village because it didn't, if he refused to, the village of Hamelin refused to pay him his due. He, he came... And with his music, he led away all the rats. All the rats left the village. Then he came back to be paid and the village refused. So he played again and all the children left. <laughs> and it's, there's a lot in that. Um, Ovid writes, uh, as the Roman poet, um, quid, quid, quid marinum novit, quae nescita rionatelius, Carmine Corrente's Illite Nebata Quas. What, what sea does not know of, Ari, uh, of Arion, what, what land does not know of him, with his song, his music, he used to stop the flowing waters. Carmine Corrente's Illite Nebata Quas. With his song, Carmine. Uh, Corrente's the running aquas waters, Teneba, he, he held the waters, he held up the waters with his song. So the water, again, mineral, this is mineral baying music. Well, it's difficult to imagine, but it may have happened. Plants certainly listen to music. It's a very important language of God for humans to express themselves, to express what's going on in their souls. That is why nobody should t not take music seriously. But, it, but um, the modern world despises music, broadly speaking, because um, it, it's, it, it, it's turning away from God. It's t it doesn't want to acknowledge anything superior to man. And therefore, it's anything higher of man, it, it discounts. In poetry is in the same category. Modern man despises poetry. If poetry is quoted in, um, if poetry is quoted in a newspaper, it's always printed just as though it's prose. They're practically always printed as though it's prose because they know if they print it as poetry, people are not going to read it. They're not going to touch it. They're not going to read the article because it's going to tell of something superior to their materialism and they don't want to have to ask themselves is there anything superior to my materialism? Of course there is, but they don't, they don't want to acknowledge it. There's nothing superior to us materialistic men. So music gets despised, poetry gets despised, anything remotely spiritual or superior is going to be despised by modern man and rejected because it, it's, it's a rebuke to him. Anything superior is a rebuke to democratic man. He wants everything to be l l reduced to the lower level where everybody's equal. 
Nobody's allowed to surpass the rest. No excellence. No teacher on a dais. Always everybody, the teacher sitting on the floor with all the students around him. Because he's not superior. He's, not, he's on the same level as they are. They are on the same level as he is. Of course they aren't. Because he knows something that they don't and they need something that they need to know. Poor democratic man. He shuts out of his life anything that might come from above to tell him that there's something more. And then the youth are very frustrated because they still, they, they still sense there must be something more. But they usually come to terms with the materialistic world. They, they, they start playing rock and roll and then they make a lot of money making rock and roll because all of the youngsters, the youngsters respond to that. They shouldn't, but they do. Their parents have not taught them anything better. Parents must try to teach their children. Best is if the parents um, uh, practice, play an instrument themselves. I can remember when, when I was... Um, I used to visit Europe um, from the United States. I was stationed in the United States, but I came to visit Europe. I, I remember... A, I read once a book of a Jewess which, which much impressed me. Um, Judith Cabo, have any of you heard that name? C A B A U D. Judith Cabo. She was a Brooklyn Jewess, but she came to Europe, visited Europe, went on a bicycle excursion. No, no, no. I think, yeah, it's probably, I mean, it may have been about a bicycle too, with a Frenchman, and she married him, and she stayed in France, and they had, I think, nine children. And uh, I got to know her through her book, and um, she loved, she got to, into classical music through Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. If any of you are not into uh, classical music, you might enjoy Rachmaninoff. It's very famous and very popular, very romantic, in a good sense. Uh, Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. Um, and she got into classical music through that. Uh, her husband loved Wagner. And she got into Wagner naturally through him. And um, at a given point, I invited her to give a conference to the seminarians when I was rector of the seminary. Um, that was not such a success. She wasn't necessarily a good lecturer, couldn't say so easy in a lecture what she put in her book. But I remember visiting them at home. And the little boy, there was a four-year-old boy, was the last of the children. And uh, the, the rest, all the rest of the children played some instrument. She played the piano, I think, and they made a little orchestra. And uh, on one of my visits, uh, the, the little four-year-old was not yet playing. So he, he sat on my lap, and I could see he was listening to the music the, the, that the rest of the family were playing. Four years old, but it was going in. It was going in. The harmony was going in. The order was going in. The beauty was going in. And I said to myself, this child is not going to fall for rock. He's, going to, he, he's instinctively going to repulse rock. Rock is disorder, ugliness, horror, the refusal of God, the de declaration of democracy, and so on and so on and so on. The, the ref rock is the refusal of the spiritual. It's the, this cry of, of, a cry of rage and a cry of anguish from a lot of modern youngsters it, because they are out of tune with, with, with God's creation because they, they only know modern man's creation and therefore they're, they're, being, sh they're being boxed into this anti-spirituality by this music. Another thing I noticed at, at a school where I was teaching in London for a while, um, the boys, the little boys of 12 and 13, the, the school was for boys between 13 and 18, and uh, what you call, what here is called, uh, what do you call, uh, secondary school, do we call, is that the English name? Secondary school. And, um, what was I going to say? Yes. When the, the boys came in at 12 or 13, they were neatly dressed, the, the, the jacket buttons were done up, the shirt was not outside the trousers, there was a tie, a necktie. They were, they were orderly and, and 
quite presentable. This is we're talking about the 19... 19... One moment. I, I lose the decades. 60s. 1960s, yes, that's right. And the, 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 then they began listening to rock music and the buttons came undone, the shirt came outside of the trousers, the necktie disappeared, or was just tied completely loosely. It was dissolution, you could see. And it started with the music. It's the music with which the music, these musicians got into these children. And the musicians were very conscious of it. The rock musicians are very conscious of their quasi-demonic power. If, if the music isn't both Almighty God and the devil make use of music, the devil with disorderly music plants disorder in human souls. The church with Gregorian chant and with Palestrina and with um, plants order and beauty in human souls. The church makes a tremendous use of music. You start a traditional chapel and soon uh, you're going to get somebody wanting to buy an organ and or sing some of the chant and then you get fights. <laughs> Immediately the fights begin, right, John? Yes. <laughs> Why? Because human beings feel music so deeply. Music runs so deep. It's a deep part of me. It's an important part of me. You try depriving a child who only knows rock. Try depriving him of his rock and you're going to get squeals of pain. Because that's the music he knows. And he, he, he needs that music. Tell me what music a man likes and I'll tell you who he is. Tell me what friends a man has and I'll tell you who he is. There are various ways of telling what goes on inside human beings, but the, the, man, the music a man likes, Shakespeare was onto it. Tolstoy was onto it. These great, the great writers, are, none of them write onto it. Tolstoy has a short story called The Kreutzer Sonata, which is, uh, uh, the Kreutzer Sonata is by Beethoven. It's a, pup, a sonata of a violin and piano, and it's very powerful. It's very, uh, you, can you play off uh, uh, out of your head? Uh, uh, it's just the theme. The music whips you along. And Tolstoy it grasped this. He certainly responded to music. And he grasped this and he makes the story <coughs> into a, a story of passion, of unbridled passion, between, I think, the, the violinist and the pianist, who are not husband and wife. They are man and woman, but they're not husband and wife. And I think it's a... I don't remember. But certainly Tol... He, he rates the music as being destructive in character. Because Beethoven can be destructive in character. We'll see that. You've already seen it. You, in, uh, in, uh, yes. You've certainly seen it in, in um, the Coriolanus, where the, the general gets uh, defeated. But he, he may well deserve to be defeated. So that's not necessarily a, a tragic end. It's tragic in Coriolanus, but not necessarily for the Volsci or for Rome. So... Um, Music has to be taken seriously, and accursed is he who, who can't... There are some famous Shakespeare quotes on music. Um, if music be the food of love, play on. That's the first line of the Twelfth Night. But there are other quotes as well. He obviously understood and, and picked up on music. Tolstoy responded very much to La ci darem la mano. Can you play that?
Well done. <laughs> Straight out of his head. Um, uh, that's Mozart. Um, music is very powerful. It's a molder of souls. And it must be taken seriously. Parents, as I repeat, parents must take music seriously when it comes to educating and forming their children. Uh, any questions so far? Or on the chart of the chart of the soul? There may be one or two more things, but I think that's easily most of it. So rock music is a revolution. A revolution is when something, a wheel is turned around. What was on top goes to the bottom, what was on the bottom goes to the top. And when rhythm takes over in music, you've got a downward, a downward course. Rhythm is a, a precious element of music. A rhythm is implicit in Gregorian. Or it's the, any piece of music by Beethoven will be uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, or one, two, one, two, one, two, or one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. In any case, it's, it's got a regular beat. But um, the Gregorian chant is free of that. The rhythm is there. Three, three, and then two, 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 two. Kiri da one two three one two three one two three one two three one two one two one the the, it's, the music is free in the way that the classical music isn't it's the the rhythm is in in the melody whereas in Beethoven the the the, the melody will have a, normally have a fixed rhythm. Beethoven interrupts that rhythm. He's perfectly capable of interrupting it. The Eroica, which possibly you're going to hear, um, he, the, 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 it's one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, uh, which is offbeat. It's clearly, it absolutely interrupts the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, but the, all the rest of it is in one, two, three. So the rhythm in Beethoven, Beethoven is very powerful with rhythm. His rhythm is very powerful, but it's in a way mechanical when compared with the rhythm in Gregorian chant. Would you say that's fair? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say mechanical. I would say um, <laughs> passionate and dramatic. Very human, I would say. And Gregorian chant is aiming at elevating us, Yes. whereas in, in those passages of Beethoven's music where he is allowing rhythm to, to dominate, he is depicting the passions overcoming yes. the, the intellect. Yes. And uh, that is... Uh, Potentially dangerous. Uh, certainly dangerous, but in limited, not yet mechanical, I would say. Yeah, in limited doses, it's, uh, it's very expressive. Um, but in that same passage, in the Eroica, perhaps you can play it by memory. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, can, but, I can hold up. Yes. Um, this, the, in, the, in, the, in the development, um, the, the, that horrible discord, the pass, passage, which is not very pretty or melodic, it's jagged, and it, 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 there's some tremendous heavy chords, and they culminate in a sharp discord. Um, but then out of the jaws of the lion comes a new melodic line, a new lovely melody, towards the beginning of the... Uh, or about halfway through the development. Where should I start? Uh, with the... Um, uh, we can do...
you can a very powerful build up to a shocking discord and then another melody. So out of the jaws of the lion comes honey with Beethoven. So the disorder is there, but in that this particular instance, the, it it uh, high it heightens the return of harmony and order. So you know, it's like beef without any mustard might be boring. Okay. With mustard, the mustard sets off the beef. And the harshness and the discord sets off the sets off the return of order. May I add one? one Go ahead, John. So, uh, Beethoven is very powerful because he combines those destructive forces with a very strong uh, grasp of the structure. He doesn't let it uh, the 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 the, uh, the rhythm and the sort of destructive forces of the music don't overwhelm it, except in very special cases. But in the Eroica movement I was just playing, it, 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 he, he resolves it. He takes the conflict and uh, at the end of the movement, which is 15 minutes later, it's, there's a big uh, passage which is very harmonically simple. It resolves the tension of it after all this. Let me go back to the the effect of resolving all of the uh, tension that was uh, so present and could be allowed to, if it, if it were let loose, it would be destructive. But in this case, he's containing it and resolving it. And that's one reason why I think he's so important in, in the modern world, especially because he's aware of all of the craziness and the chaos that's around it, but he finds order. And in, in most cases, not all, he he triumphs over it, and even in the cases where he, where the music ends in tragedy, that still is a very uh, rewarding in artistic terms to have an uh, artistically organized account of the tragedy and the destruction instead of just everything falls apart. Yes, modern music is is everything falling apart. It's horrible. There's the ugly, all the ugliness is there, but it's not resolved. Because that people today don't, the musicians don't have God. They're most of them disbelievers, surely. They may still have some of the talent of a musician from God, but without God, it, it, it's just, it, it turns into horror. So, uh, tomorrow we're, 